Okay, we should be live. So, welcome everybody to this uh, improvised live stream. So I just uh, published a video talking about making sense of the different personas of a narcissist and uh, I got a few questions about what do you do when you, you hit rock bottom. So I thought I'd do a live stream. Uh, we can take the questions live. Let me know in the chat whatever questions you have and I will, I'll share a few thoughts about this. Of course, what is really important to remember is everybody's journey is different. Everyone's path is different. Everyone's challenges are different. We can share what works for us. It doesn't mean it works for someone else. So it's always a good idea. You take what people say and suggest. You take their stories and then think, how do I adapt this to myself? Because the, the people we're dealing with are not the same people, obviously. We are not the same people, obviously. Our starting point is not the same. It's a bit like, um, I, I liken it to, if you want to climb a mountain, you want to hike up a mountain, and you ask someone, how did you do that when you hiked up that mountain? If they give you the specific path that they followed, well, it worked for their mountain, but you're not necessarily on the same mountain. You don't necessarily have the same starting point. You're not necessarily the same size, the same weight. You don't do the same steps. You don't have the same uh, equipment, and so on and uh, so forth. So, hi, welcome. Welcome, UA. Welcome, Shiva's girl. Uh, so, this to me is, is really important whenever you're listening to, to stories and anecdotes. However, it can also give inspiration to think, this worked for this person, let me think about it, let me see if it makes sense for me. If it doesn't make sense for me, great, if it doesn't, then maybe I learned something, maybe it will inspire me to do something, you know, a bit different. So, let me know in the chat specific questions you have. Uh, we, we're going to keep it roughly framed around what do you do when you're hitting rock bottom? I so there were the, 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 there was one comment in the the live well the live premiere before about hitting rock bottom, and I mentioned that I well I remember what it was like uh, hitting rock bottom. I remember the feeling of of confusion, of loneliness, the feeling of um, mainly just utter confusion and a sense of direction, and you know the the different. The different reasons for this. I think one of the reasons is because, no, here, you know what, let me I join with the iPad. There we go. Normally, if we're in a good place, we've got different pillars of life. One of the pillars, obviously, is our family. The people that we grew up with, they give us some sense of stability. Another one would be, obviously, friends. Another one would be work. Another one would be hobbies. And then we'd have uh, also, um, let's see, work hobbies, it would be self care, let's call it self care, that would be sport, food, and so on. And also, obviously, a relationship. And the more we have, oops, the more we have of these, and the more balanced they are, the more balanced our life is. So here's actually an exercise. Let me make this a bit more interactive. Uh, an exercise. If you take, let's say, these six, start with the six, you could add more, you could remove some. If you were to rate how strong they are in your life now between zero and three, three is very strong. I could do, let's say, zero to 10, but I'm going to keep it simple zero to three. Three very strong, two quite strong, one quite weak, and zero terrible. I would guess that most people, for most of these, I'm just thinking out loud now, let's do it zero to five. It adds a bit more nuance. Let's say most people, for most of these things, would have a score that would be somewhere between two to four out of five. It might be a five out of five, in which case it's amazing. But most people, like the family, it's not going to be a five out of five. There's always some kind of conflict. So there might be some balance of two to four on average. And if you have this for, let's say, one, two, three, four, five, six, that would be a total score of 12 to 24 points out of a total of 30. I should rewrite this, make it easier to read. 12 to 24 out of a total of 30. Now, one of the the things that we observe narcissists do systematically is they make us overweight the relationship with them. They separate us from the friends, the family. They put pressure so work usually doesn't work quite that well. 
They don't like our hobbies and they don't want any room for self-care. So typically, instead of being, let's say, either in the yellow or green zone, we'll call, we say the, we say you've got four zones. Red is bad, yellow is okay, and green is great. There we go, great. Instead of having most of them between the yellow and green zone, a lot of them suddenly become red zone. Family, like, they'll be saying, you know, your, your sibling is jealous of you, or your family have been oppressing you, or they've been doing this thing. Try to isolate people. If you're able to make the, the relationship be the most important part by far, the one that takes up the most space, even if the quality is low, if it takes up the most space, what you do is, instead of having a, a, a building with six pillars of stability, you only have one pillar. So what happens if that pillar gets knocked out? Well, you're left with nothing. You're left with ruins because you can't fall back on the friends, the family, the support system because they're weakened. Well, to some extent, you can fall back, but not as much as you'd like to. And and also simply the, the weight of the relationship in the life became bigger. So normally, we'd say in a healthy situation, you might have like a pie and you'd have the different parts, you know, family, friends, oops, friends, work. You could actually do this exercise and just say, what is the percentage of each of these for you? Relationship, uh, self care, and hobbies. So you'd want some form of balance. Put it this way more than none of your time could be spent with each of these things that matter to you that provide you with balance. Now, what the, what, what the toxic person, the narcissist, wants is rather have a situation where this is them. And then you've got a tiny bit of space for the rest. And every single time, you'll observe this, every single time you want to do more things, like for yourself, with hobbies, with friends, there'll be drama. So what are you going to do? You want to avoid the drama, so you get conditioned. This is like Pavlovian conditioning to not do it. If you know every time you do something, you're going to get whacked. At one point you realize, well, if I do it, I get whacked. I don't want to get whacked. Therefore, I have to do it. Therefore, I have to sacrifice all of these really important parts, hobbies, relation, uh, hobbies, self-care, work, friends, and family. Uh, incidentally, we observe sometimes the, the level of resentment that toxic people have when people have, you know, they, they want to spend more time with the family. It's like, well, that's an unhealthy relationship with your family. Well, maybe it is. But what does it mean, unhealthy? Why would we listen to them? What incentive do they have? Healthy people would say, or might say, I'm not sure how balanced your relationship with your family is but you know if it works for you fine you know work on it with a therapist I won't tell you what to do just make sure it works for you or you spend a lot of time with your with your your mother and she's pretty domineering I'm not certain that works for me but you know you work it out it's sort of open-ended with toxic people it's close-ended they know exactly what they want um and then you see that also like with um with 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 hobbies the resentment like i i remember i posted this this uh clip from another life where i spoke about the woman who had a fight with her husband because her husband wanted to see a very important football match for him so first time in 12 years his team qualified and a lot of people are really upset football is stupid okay well you can say that but if it's your partner's hobby and they enjoy it who are you to criticize that if you don't like it it's fine but if you want to go and see a spice girls concert i could really berate you and belittle you, but that would be mean. If you enjoy it, great, you know, knock, knock yourself out. Um, no, if taste, whatever, if people enjoy it, that's fine. Let me have a quick look in the, in the chat. Here we go. Okay. Worthlessness. Perfect. So in the sense, interesting program grooming, running your brain. It's fiction. You are okay. Absolutely. Uh, I did a video about that by the way, I think somewhere um, probably had a very bad title that doesn't allow people to realize what's, what the, the topic is. But if you remind me in the chat, if in the, the comments, then I'll look for that. Um, so yes, if we 
And actually, that ties into this. If we remove the different pillars, remember each of these pillars brings us some level of self-worth. The family, they remind us of what ought to be sort of unconditional love. So you can disagree, you can fight, but siblings are siblings. You, ha you look out for each other. If anything goes bad, the family is there, and it's hard widened to us. Well, it's hard widened to us, and we've been gaslit to believe it shouldn't be. But that's just gaslighting. It's hardwired into us that family is important, which is one of the reasons why abuse inside a family is so is so twisted because it goes against everything that we are programmed, like in our DNA, programmed to believe. So it's so difficult to see this. I actually had a conversation with someone who realized that she had been uh, beaten as a child by her parents, but she's completely blocked it out. And we spoke about the dynamics of how it's very difficult for a child to understand that sometimes some parents just are a bit crap and they do bad things and it's not their fault. And she'd always been rationalizing, it must be me. Uh, and she said, well, you know, my father would beat me, but then I'd run to him. It's like, oh, obviously you would. It's, it's, so, it's so common. You seem surprised, but it's really common because, you know, you're looking for him. Who is, I remember um, Richard Grannon was saying, something that about the how the parents for a child play the role of God because they 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 feed you they clothe you they keep you safe so if quote unquote God is berating you and belittling you and hitting you then you must have done something wrong and that can be really hard to wrap your, your mind around even as an, even as an adult now imagine you know a five-year-old uh, so all of these points friends family work self-care and hobbies they help increase our self-esteem. So if we remove all of these sources of self-esteem, first of all, we become more vulnerable. Secondly, it makes it easier for the person to use the relationship to belittle us and hurt us. And then we, we're sort of caught, like where does our, um, where does our loyalty, our main loyalty lie? Does it mainly lie with our life? You know, that we, that we like all these things or does it lie with the relationship with a toxic person? That's a bit of a Stockholm Syndrome thing. You're taken hostage and you develop feelings and you don't see that it's being abusive. We go through the, the chat very quickly. Hey, Kay, good to see you. Um, okay, there's a, there's a lot to cover. I'll, I'll do my best to do this. Keep questions coming and comments coming. Um... Yeah, it teaches you that other people's opinions matter most. Okay, this, by the way, I just touched upon this very quickly because I'm I'm working on another video trying to get the angle right about this. There's there's something called ad hominem attacks. Ad hominem attacks are when you say something I disagree, and instead of attacking your argument, I attack you. Now the two sides of the ad hominem attack. One side is simply one side is simply to to insult you. You don't have a degree, so you don't know what you're talking about, so I shouldn't listen to you. You don't actually see if the person makes sense. You're conflating qualifications with, uh, with sense-making. And conversely, this person's a PhD, you're not, so you should shut up and listen to them. It seems to make sense, but it only makes sense if all PhDs agree, or all professors agree, or all specialists in the sector agree, which is not the case. We, we see time and time again equally qualified people who disagree. So how do we know who to listen to? Well, we have to lose our logic. And narcissists don't want people to use their logic. And conversely, that's saying, so it's berating you because you don't have as many qualifications as the other person, or you're not qualified. And then it's saying, you should listen to this person because they're qualified. But you're not listening to them because they make sense. All narcissists do is they cherry pick the specialists who agree with them. And they say, well, this person's a specialist, they agree. We agree, therefore you should listen to them. But the only reason why is because they is sort of backing their point instead of making sense. Uh, it's it's it, Once you see it, it's hilarious to see. I actually have someone to, to, to thank who left a comment about this uh, on a video uh, questioning my qualifications. I don't want to talk about them. I explained why I don't want to talk about them, uh, specifically to avoid this. Um, but their point was, well, if you don't have any qualifications, we shouldn't listen to you. Like, okay, well... I'd rather you think of my arguments, see if they make sense, rather than I flaunt my qualifications, because I'd rather that you don't fall into the ad hominem trap. 
of listening to people because they're qualified or because they're more qualified. Uh, this is a, a key point in therapy, incidentally. Therapists should never assume the high position over the patient. The person who's sitting there stroking their chin going, I know better, I can explain you, they're, they're, they're participating in the drama triangle, they're participating in the person's problem. The real position of the therapist is as equals, and we're humans, and you know the therapist has tools that you might not have and can ask relevant questions, but you are the hero of your journey. Uh, it's akin to, in, in Harry Potter, Harry Potter is the hero, it isn't Dumbledore. And Dumbledore doesn't talk down to Harry. Dumbledore empowers Harry. Uh, that's a key point, by the way, with this, uh, the, this huge thing. People who want you to succeed empower you and they don't talk down to you, or to, to us. People who talk down to us don't want us to succeed and they want us to be reliant on them. And th this is basic manipulation. It's super common. It's something that, uh, and very well known, it's something that therapists learn to avoid because they know that if they don't avoid it, they'll make the situation worse. So some of them weaponize it. And I've known a few who specifically did everything they weren't supposed to do because it's great for the business and the cash flow, but it's completely immoral. Um, and mor yeah, completely morally corrupt. Let me have a look here at the chat because it's, it's great, by the way. It's great when, when you guys are chatting. I really enjoy it. And I love the quality of the chats um, and the comments. Really, I'm blown away. It's really cool. Uh, okay, so let's get back into this because this is this is really interesting. Um, so you and I, exactly. Brain, yeah. If you have a functioning brain, that's it. Let the argument carry itself. If it does, great. If it doesn't, it doesn't, regardless of the person making it. So, one thing here is when we when we learn to, uh, well, like you you're saying there, Shiva's go, when we question what happened, uh, when we question the way we think, and we, oops, and we don't we don't trust ourselves. We don't trust the way that we that we make sense of the world. When that is the case. We're giving power externally, and we've been trained to do it. So breaking this kind of game, breaking this kind of dynamic, is really, really not easy. Now, what we see time and time again is that the patterns that we learned growing up are patterns that we repeat until we recognize the pattern and we learn to break it. It's the autopilot. It's sort of the card playing sequence. If you play this card and I play that one, the next one is like this and it, or dance. It's just like a dance. If we want to do a different dance, we have to stop doing the dance that we've been doing so far, which is which can be really, really tough. Now, going through the um, going through the, the, the breakdown of things, what uh, I'm just thinking how to how to position this. Let's okay. Let's let's illustrate it this way. Here we go. Let's say this is how much stability we have in percentage. This is the overall percentage of stability. But let's say if we look at this like a box of different percentages, it's a mixed bag. Some things are really great, really stable. Other things are question marks, and some other things are really toxic. If you were to build a building and you have cement, you want to make sure all of the cement is of the same quality and the minimum quality reaches certain requirements. You don't want some of your pillars to be based on cement that is of low quality or instead of cement you have sand because everything is going to fall down. Now what what observes uh, what, what I observe happens when things start getting shaky is we can't tell what is what. We can't tell if we're dealing with something that's true, something that is let's say a question mark or something that is toxic. Because we can't tell, we, we don't know where to start. I mean, we generally with these relation, with relationships, we have certain assumptions. Assumptions such as parents love their children. You know, fair assumption, but obviously not true when we observe reality. Parents of the children, this person loves me. 
This person is sincere. This person actually means this. And it's it's I, I liken this to having um, to having an apple pie, and inside the apple pie, you've got of course some apples, but you also have some broken glass. And you don't know what's what. So you take a bite and you don't know if it's just going to be nice apple pie or if it's going to cut you inside and probably kill you. And it's really tough when you're, when you're, you, you've got a worldview that you believe is roughly accurate and all of a sudden things don't work out. So you build up your worldview about a relationship and promises and you start, you start having to second guess every single piece of information. This is demoralizing and scary because we don't know what's true anymore. So many things we thought were true start crumbling. And we realize that we're not at 100%, we're going lower, but we don't know quite how low we're going to go. And the sense I have is rock bottom is when we basically say, I can't go lower than this. Everything has become a question mark. I don't know where to start. I don't know if it's something that's true or something that's false. I'm I'm baffled. I, I, I don't know where to start. Let me know, by the way, in the chat. Is this roughly accurate? And I just go through the, through the, uh, the comments. Um, okay, we'll address the thing of becoming an idiot because that's not possible. Yeah. Okay. So, for me, the hitting rock bottom was basically saying that all of these things I thought I knew about the world, and I, I clearly I'm wrong on some things, but I don't know what I'm wrong about, uh, which can be very bizarre to suddenly start second guessing what I know about the various relationships and myself and what I did right, what I did wrong. We have certain self images. Um, and, and so what I found the most helpful and the most terrifying, but usually there's the, the, the salvation comes after fear is to say, let me just question everything. Like all of this, all of these points, everything I think I know, let me question it. Let me check and I will either realize that it's false or probably that I don't know. And I'll start building up from that. And let me see if there's anything I can find that actually is going to be something I do know. And I did. But this requires the willingness to sacrifice all of the lies. And most of us have a bit of a mixed bag of... of you know, the way we see the world, the way we see ourselves, where there is some level of, of self-deception, uh, some level of lies, the, um, you know, we want to portray ourselves a certain way. We want to believe we are a certain way. We, we, we want to believe things about the world instead of just asking, how is the world? And that's a big difference. How is it versus how do I want it to be? Once we put aside the how I want it to be to just that go, I just want the truth. I can handle the truth. It can be painful. There's a band-aid on, rip it off. I don't mind. But if something needs disinfection, I'll get it out. If, for example, let's say we rate the relationship in the negatives and the positive, oops, and the positives, if we see that our life was around here, we shoot up into the super positives, that's the uh, love bombing phase, and then it starts crashing down, and then we're down completely in the negatives. There are probably some variations as we go along. If we're if we're okay with hanging out down here, it's fine. But if we realize, and you can liken this, oh yeah, I forgot about that. We can liken this to, to being underwater. You're underwater, and you have a weight that's holding you down. 100 kilo weight. You don't know if letting go of the weight it's going to help you get to the surface. But you know if you don't do it, you're going to drown. And you're going to be staying at rock bottom, at the very bottom. To me, the the part that helped the most is... Um, the, the part that helped the most is to say, I'm going to put aside what I want, and I just want to see what is true. If it means that the highest I can get is just have my head sticking out of the water, that's fine. At least I'm not drowning. I know lies are pulling me down. These are the lies. 
Right? The sweet lies, the lies that we want to hear. Lies are poison. I know lies are poison. I know lies lead to more lies. I know that I myself have lied to others, to myself. I've deceived myself that things I didn't want to see. Often it's a coping mechanism. So there's no there's no judgment there. It's just an observation. Something I learned, by the way, with lie detection, observe, stop judging. Just observe. You know, the good, bad, just stop. Just observe. Lies lead to worse outcomes. People who want us to lie want us to have worse outcomes. It's logical. People who want us to lie to ourselves want us to gaslight ourselves. Why? Because if we gaslight ourselves, we're easy to gaslight. And they want us to be more vulnerable. Uh, and you, you see this all the time in, in the public sphere. People who lie to others knowingly. And you go, but that clearly is a lie. You want me to lie to myself? Yeah, it's gaslighting. It's just about, just about power. It's so, it's so common. It's boring. So, hitting rock bottom, going, I'm, I'll, I'll get rid of, I want to get rid of the lies, so I'm going to get rid of everything that doesn't work. Uh, to me, it's, it's likening it to burning the dead wood. I don't know what is good. I don't know what's bad. Let me burn everything and see what stays. Um, I, I'd liken that to if you have some kind of infection on your arm and you need to put your arm in some disinfectant and it's going to burn all of the cuts, it's going to be horrible. That's true and painful. That is true. And what's the alternative? The alternative is probably getting your arm amputated at one point. With that perspective, disinfect it. It might be unpleasant. It only gets worse if we don't do that. So for me, with the with the the hitting rock bottom, it was getting to the point of thinking, this is horrible. I never want this to happen again. The only way I stand a chance of it not happening again is cutting out the lies. It's identifying the these uh, the, the red dots and getting rid of them. And then I see what happens. It's my best bet. It's my safest bet. And, uh, well, you know what? At one point, you can find one element of logic that helps you build back. One stone you can you can actually stand on that, that helps you make sense. You just go through the, the comments now. Um... Okay, so apparently I'm in your head. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. We're, you know, just at different stages. Um, we learn a lot quickly. You know, in, in, in compare yourself to who you were yesterday. Compare yourself to who you were three months ago and look at how far you've come. You know, if somebody walks up the mountain and has a head start of two years, yeah, they'll be further ahead than you. But remember that when you walk up the mountain, you see the people in front of you. You don't see the people behind you. So always remember, you've come a certain path. We've come a certain path. Uh, we see the people ahead of us, and that's that's perfectly that's perfectly normal. So hitting hitting rock bottom, to me was, it's rock bottom was what it took for me to say, I need to. Uh, oh hi, Maribel. Welcome. Um, let me see what exactly is qualified. Okay, if you want to specify, oops, if you want to specify your question about what is, just one second, what exactly is qualified, then I'm happy to answer that. I'm not sure if that, the question was for me. Um, yeah, listen, I think I think it's pretty pretty universal. So for me, hitting rock bottom was getting to the point of going. Now enough is enough. Now I can't take it anymore. Now it's now it's too much. It took me to that very specific point, you know, of basically nearly drowning, to go, now, how about this? It's something like, you can choose between two fears. Imagine that you are, imagine that you're standing somewhere and you realize there's a little fire in front of you. So the fire is pretty scary. You know, you don't want to get burnt. There we go. Nice big screen. You don't want to get burnt. You don't want to, you don't, you don't want to hurt yourself. But then you look behind you and what do you see? You see that behind you, where you have a forest, the entire forest 
is a blaze. And you get to pick. Do you go right or do you go left? Which of the two scares you the most? Which of the two scares you the least? You pick the one that is the least scary. Often in our heads we go, well, I don't want any of these. I don't, I don't want the one in front of me. It's like the alternative is the one behind you. I don't want the pain of putting disinfectant on a wound. Okay? The alternative is that the wound gets worse and then it's going to hurt more. What are you going to do about it? But I don't want it. It's sort of, well, what you want is irrelevant. Something I learned that was, um, that was really helpful was the was learning to surf, spending time on a surfboard. Because you don't control the sea, you don't control the waves. They come at you and you deal with whatever the waves give you. You might go, well, that was unfair because the wave wasn't good. It's like, maybe, but someone else got it. So that's it. You ended up in the water, so you got it wrong. It's fine. But if you complain about things, reality doesn't care. All that happens is that you're missing out on the wave, and whilst you're in the water complaining, somebody else is having a good time. So you learn to accept reality, and you learn to to get up. So for me, this, this is what it was, the, the hitting rock bottom, was thinking, facing the things that terrify me the most, that's pretty scary. Being in this situation again, that's, that's, that's worse. I never, ever, ever want to be in this situation again. So in order to not be in this situation again, what I have to do is face the things that scare me. Don't have the choice. The beautiful thing, by the way, is that once we face the things that scare us, they don't, they don't turn out to be as expected. Now, here's a question for you. You have and uh, you can let me know in the chat. You've been afraid of things in the past. The question is, the things you're afraid of, have they ever occurred 100% according to what you were afraid of? Has it ever been exactly 100% or has it ever been less than 100%? Let me know in the chat. Oh, the chat might be a little bit longer, but basically, it never occurs 100%. If it occurred 100%, things would be very different. Why? Because fear is the emotion that helps us stay alive when there's a threat of physical danger or social rejection. And fear is linked to uncertainty. If you look at um, Paul Ekman's Atlas of Emotions, which I highly, highly, highly recommend, it's a beautiful website, so atlasofemotions.org, they talk about fear and the function of fear. And you will notice that the majority of the words around fear are linked to uncertainty. This incident, exactly, uh, the fears were overblown. So for example, someone's afraid of getting disinfectant because it's going to hurt. The solution to this, I found, is to tell the person, in terms of pain, your pain is probably going to be between a four and a six and it's likely to last about 10 seconds. By doing this, I reduce the uncertainty. I ask, can you deal with it? If, if I explain it, yes. When I do body work and energy work with people, so releasing the emotions of anger and fear and sadness and of all of that, it can be mind-blowingly painful. It's one of the, the most painful experiences I've, I've had in my life, and it's, it's really helpful. Uh, and to understand the pain is going to reach 9 or 10 and get to the point where I feel like I can't take it anymore, then it's going to flip and dissipate, and it's probably going to last 10, 20, 30 seconds max. Then it's going, well, would I prefer to have 30 seconds of mind-numbingly intense pain and feel like a burden I've been carrying on my shoulders for the past decades has been lifted, or would I prefer to continue walking with this burden that is jeopardizing my life, like, I'm afraid of the pain, but I'm even more afraid of continuing to carry the burden. So fear is linked to the, to, the, to the uncertainty. Now what we realize is once we find the courage to face it, well, all of a sudden, the fear drops significantly, and 
it turns out that, well, the danger is not 100%, so we usually imagine the worst situation. So if it's lower than, how does it go, lower than 100%, lower than 100%, it probably isn't that bad. It can be helpful, by the way, to look at different scenarios and you weight the scenarios. Okay, this is the worst case scenario and the next worst and so on. Get two, three scenarios and go, what percentage probability do I give for each? The worst case scenario might be a 10%, the next one a 30 and then the last one 60%. I spoke with, by the way, with someone who was hyper anxious because her spouse skis and she's afraid something might happen to him. So we just did the math. How many people does she think every day have ski accidents in that specific uh, ski resort? She said, well, maybe one. Okay. How many people ski there? She said, maybe, maybe 5,000. Okay. Let's imagine it's five times more. That's one chance in a thousand. Of all of the accidents, how many are deadly? She goes, well, probably none. Okay. How many are, if we were to take, let's say a hundred accidents over the season, what percentage are deadly? What percentage are really bad? What percentage are just annoying? And what percentage are innocuous? And she goes, well, most of them are not that bad. Okay. And then we start breaking it down by saying, how about the different skiers? You got the bad skiers and you've got the crazy skiers, and you've got the good skiers. What is the what is the risk that the good skiers, the good, safe ones, actually are the ones of the accident? And we ended up with something like a 0.0001% risk of something wrong, something bad happening. Like, you know, if that's the case, using percentages is our friend because it helps us make sense of, of, uh, of fear and of danger. Um... Okay. Wow, that's weird. An investment. I guess the person worked in finance, but that's uh, it's a strange, strange wording. Anyway. Um. Yeah. So, here, let, let, let me let me tell you a story. Um. I sometimes get requests for recording stories. Let's do the small exercise. Close your eyes, and I'll tell you a story. Close your eyes. Breathe. Breathe deeply. Now, imagine that you are in a forest, in a log cabin. And outside the log cabin, a dragon is roaming. The dragon is looking for you. The dragon can smell you. The dragon knows you are somewhere, but doesn't know where you are. And you hear... The dragon's heavy footsteps around the cabin. You hear the thud. You hear the ground shake and you're inside the cabin and you're petrified. And you are so scared that the dragon will find you, will burn down the log cabin and will eat you. And at one point you realize you've been there for a long time and you're tired. You're tired. You're tired of waiting in fear. You're tired of being petrified. Inside the cabin, there's an armor and a sword and a shield. And you think, if I'm going to die, I will die with dignity. I will go out. I'll face the dragon. The dragon will probably burn me or eat me. But I will die with dignity because I can't live with it. I can't live like this anymore. So you walk up to the armor. You put on the armor. You take the sword. You take the shield. You put on the helmet. You breathe in deeply for one of the last times and you're willing, you're ready to walk out and face the dragon. And you open the door and you see the dragon and the dragon sees you and your eyes lock and you realize that the dragon is just a little lizard that's been walking around and the heavy footsteps were not the dragon at all. And you were simply afraid of a lizard. And the lizard runs away. And that's it. Out you go. And you move on with your life. And the next time you're afraid of something, you realize maybe it's not a dragon. And if it is, let me face it anyway, because I might as well live with dignity. And if I walk straight up to it, and it really is a dragon, well, you know, you stand a better chance. But at least the rest of your life, you don't live in fear. That's as a story I use quite often with my clients to, to reframe fear. And um, I, she was, 
uh, welcome back. So you can you can always rewind on the live stream and see the last bit. I was telling the the dragon story that people find quite quite helpful. So back to the here we go back to the fear. The fear is not one hundred percent of reality. Reality is lower than one hundred percent. So one of the one of the key points is just to say, let me find what is frightening me in life and let me face it. Um, another story, by the way. Not quite dragon story, but another story. This, I believe, is the story of the, the Knights of the Round Table. So Sir, Sir Arthur and his Knights of the Round Table go looking for the Holy Grail. And the Holy Grail, so symbol of eternal life, that which will bring eternal life. And they find out that the grail is hidden inside a forest, a deep, dark, scary, frightening forest. And remember, this is the Middle Ages, where forests were terrifying places for many, many, many reasons. And the many entrances to the forest, and what they decide to do is that each night will find the entrance that frightens him, frightens him the most and will walk in there because it is when we walk in the entrance that scares us the most that we stand a chance of finding the Holy Grail and eternal life. And when, when I work with, with people, I like take the image of myself and other support people, um, you know, some people have been inside, they found their, their grail or they, they're, they're on the path. We can walk with you up to the forest and then you're on your own. You have to go inside on your own. You can't go inside with someone else. You can go inside. If it's too tough, you can come back outside. You can rest. You can relax. You can, If you have wounds, we can bandage your wounds. But you have to go inside alone. And until you're ready to, well, you're not going to find peace of mind. But once you are ready to, it's not going to be as hard as you as you think. It's like the dragon. The scariest part is facing it. Once you've decided to face it, it's, it's not that difficult. That's what we see also when we do uh, work with emotions. The scariest part is getting people to be ready to do work with emotions. And once they're willing to do it, it goes very, very, very quickly. But the, the like, re remember, easy, important things are not easy, and easy things are not important. It's something to, to always, always remember, always bear in mind. Oh, yeah, exactly, Monty Python. Yeah, 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 that's, uh, I, I always think of that with the, 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 the Holy Grail and the Killer Rabbit and so on. Um, yeah, exactly. When, when we've, when we've gone through the worst of drowning through lies, you know, we realize that that really is, is, yeah, pretty much the, the worst that we can, we can be, we can be imagining. I sort of like in that, I mentioned that in some videos, you're, you're in an amazing place, like walking around Venice and some annoying person is ruining your experience. We have limited time on this earth. Um, everything we can do here is so precious. The earth is amazing. It's amazing to be humans. And having annoying people ruin it, it's like, it's not worth it. But, it's not worth it, but that can be so difficult to see when we are stuck with a completely skewed dynamic and we're not supposed to have hobbies and enjoyment and time for ourselves and, and enjoy things. That's one of the things that narcissists do is they, they want to remove joy from life so we become more dependent on them. Um, yeah, so when I was, when I was hitting rock bottom, the main thing for me was trying to figure out inside all of this noise, where can I find something that is solid? And the first thing I found was one lie. Once I figured out this one piece of information I was given was a lie. I don't know what's true anymore, what isn't true. But I, I had proof that the person lied about one thing. Okay? If they lie about one thing, then it's possible that they lie about other things. So the first piece of information is, this person has lied to me at least once. Then it calls into question, how many other times did the person lie to me? It's like in the video of the um, uh, that, that I did just before, the one of the, the personas. If you kill a person once, you're a murderer. If you kill them 20 times, well, you're 20 times a murderer. 
There's a big difference between doing it once and not doing it. If the person lies about something fundamental and misleads you, well, that's a pretty big lie. And, you know, to start, the person has lied once, okay? What else is a lie? That starts opening quite uh, quite, quite a few other questions. Um, oh, geez, Marybelle, seriously? Kept you on the couch? That's 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 just disgusting. I'm so sorry to read that. It's it's horrible. You know, we 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 find the courage to open up to look for help, and someone takes advantage. It's um it's just repulsive. Few few things annoy me, but that that's that's something I despise. Um, sorry you went through that. Unfortunately, some some are more motivated in their own cash flow than in helping people. Uh, actually, I remember speaking with one person about the method, like the energy healing method I use, and I, I, I combine it with therapeutic methods. I think working with the head is important, like a lot of the reframing and providing people with the framework to work out the logic and listen to themselves, but also releasing the emotions. And she looked at me aghast and said, if what, you, if what you're saying works, I'm going to be out of a job. Like, that would be amazing. Amazing. I, Im imagine if you're a cancer doctor and you're out of a job because there's a cure to cancer. That would be amazing. Then be a fisherman, you know, go and enjoy life or be a golfer or, or whatever. But it would be amazing if people didn't need help. It'd be amazing. But she was aghast. So anyway, that's unfortunately that's um that is that is quite common. Um just go through this. Oh yeah, you're welcome. Happy it's it's helpful for, for other people. Uh I'm a big fan of Monty Python, so that's that's perfect. So anyway, back back to this. Uh one light. Okay, and then I start examining other things. What else doesn't add up? It's like, okay, these in, this information doesn't add up. Doesn't mean it's not true. It means it doesn't make sense to me. And then from there on, I was able to build back. But that took burning everything down and starting piece by piece. A bit like you, you have a building, building falls apart, and you want to reconstruct it, and you have to see which pieces actually make sense and are solid, and which ones are not, not solid. Um, so, so that to me was, was, was really helpful. It also meant being willing to let go of all of the lies. Uh, remember, I think I mentioned this, all of the lies served a function. So at one point it helped us. At one point, deceiving ourselves or closing our eyes, it helped us. It can help, for example, if the person's being abusive and we don't want to admit it, it can help us stay in the relationship because we feel safer staying in the relationship, especially if we are in a situation where the relationship is overweighted compared to the rest, here we go, relationship is overweighted compared to the rest, and we are super vulnerable. So of course we need to lie if we want to stay in the relationship. This to me was one of the, the, the main keys, and in my, in the workshop that I should be updating, uh, and an article about this, to me, it's one of the keys of, of healing is saying, from now on, I choose truth. I just want to know it's true. I don't want lies. I don't want games. I'm willing to take on the, dis the, the discomfort. I don't want dishonesty. I just want truth. At least with truth, I know where I stand. With the lies, I don't know where I stand. I don't know where to start. I don't know how to do anything. Um, lies, lies, how about this? Lies bring the certainty of hell on earth and truth brings the possibility of getting out of hell. I'd want to say the certainty, but let's say the possibility. If you have the choice between the certainty of hell or the possibility of getting out, I believe the possibility is preferable than the certainty of staying stuck. We might think, well, what if I try and I'm disappointed? Well, what if you try and you succeed? And maybe we should ask ourselves this question. Why would we believe that we're condemned to stay in hell? You mentioned in some of the, the some of the people were mentioning some of this goes back to past past behaviors, how we were brought up. Well, how were we brought up? What we were used to? Were we taught that truth is always okay? It's always okay to say what you think and you learn to fine-tune how you say it? Or were we told don't say what you think, say what we want to hear. When parents ask children, how are you? If the child isn't doing well, how many parents say, okay, you're not doing well, let's sit down and talk about it. And how many think, can't you just say you're doing okay? It's understandable, and it also backfires. 
Let me just check this. Yeah, exactly. Rain your spring day. Hi, by the way. Uh, I think it's I think it's important to bear this in mind. You know, to me, this was this was something that really blew my mind. With this person, was thinking, I was so convinced that everything she said was true, that for me to realize that there was a lie on a very basic thing, like is she capable of lying to me? Like that's a big that's a big red flag and lying about something, just lying about intention. Yes, I'll do this, but you're not doing it. Oh no 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 no, I I will, but you're not doing it. I, if, if you're going to do it, do it. If you don't want to, just say so. No, no, I'll do it. But you're not doing it. And then delaying and obfuscating and so on. Uh, that's one of the, 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 the key things. Like When you meet someone, there can be some level of, let's say, a lack of precision at the beginning. You don't know the person. Okay, that's fine. It can happen. Now, how quickly do you correct it? And how do you correct it? If someone... If someone gives a piece of information that's really important to the other one and they know it's a lie and the other person says, well, you told me this, this is important and they don't correct it, what else are they capable of? Raises a question. We, we don't know. And if they don't see the problem, we don't know. It's one thing if a person says, listen, I deceived you, I misled you, I feel terrible about it, here's why. That might be credible. But if they're basically saying, well, you have a problem with it, well, the real question isn't, do I have a problem with lying to me? Do you have a problem with lying to me? If you don't have a problem with lying to me, you will lie to me. The fact that I have a problem with people lying to me is my own business. But if I didn't have a problem, would you lie to me? Like, and I do have a problem, but still, you're okay lying to me. Your problem is not that you lied, it's that I have a problem with your lies. That's a completely different ball game. Whereas if we aspire to truth, and truth is really what, you know, brings us out of being, of drowning, if we aspire to truth and getting rid of lies, then we have a problem lying, we have a problem deceiving, we have a problem being misleading. Why? Because we know that lies lead to hell. So there are many reasons to lie, but it's a question of how much do we tolerate, how bad, how do we correct it, and how do we, how do we feel about it? It's one thing to say, I'm perfectly fine with it. It's something else to say, I aspire to not do it. And if I'm perfectly fine with it, that also means if I lie to myself, I invite other people to lie to me too. To me, the, the, the getting out of hitting rock bottom really, really boils down to the tension between, on the one hand, truth, and on the other hand, lies. And we pick. And this is the same as broken glass inside an apple pie. It just takes one piece of broken glass inside the apple pie for the apple pie to be worthy of getting thrown away. It takes, like we said before, the murderer, it just takes a person to kill one person once, and the person's a murderer. This was... I, mean, I, um, I don't want to get political. There was news coverage of events. I won't be too specific. You probably know what I'm talking about. News coverage events, and people were saying this was mostly peaceful. Yeah, okay. This is the same thing as saying this person was mostly peaceful. I mean, they killed people, but, you know, only three times. Only three times out of you know, however many you know days they were alive. It only happened three times. So statistically, it's, it's uh, negligible. Okay, well, maybe statistically it's only negligible, but not for the people who got killed. The lie statistically might be negligible, but if the person is okay with it in the past, they'll be okay with it in the future. And, you know, this is the logic. What is the worst someone does and are we okay with it? If we are, if we're okay with it, fine. Like, okay, it's a small lie, I don't care. If it's a big lie, it's something a bit different. To, to, to kill someone is not the same thing as to punch someone in the nose once. Like, it's not as bad. Uh, and, you know, with those mostly peaceful events, you can argue, well, we're not doing an average. Yes, there's things happening and they're not that bad. You can discuss it. But saying it's mostly like this, that's just obfuscating. That's uh, that's pure gaslighting. It's hilarious. Uh, so yeah, we we choose. Do we tolerate lies or do we try to eliminate lies? If we if we tolerate lies, we invite other people to lie to us. And the problem is that the lies keep adding up. There we go. The lies keep adding up, and they will pull us down. And that's just the way it is. That's sort of a, a law of physics. Um, 
It's a, it's sort of a law of physics. Lies. As, as a matter of fact, here's something. Let me see how to explain this. Okay, this is something I can't explain. Well, I have an explanation as to how it works, but I I'm I'm not sure how much I believe it. I just observe something. So you can you can practice it. There is the different ways of doing it. One way is you hold out the arm and you 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 test by pressing. Another way, I saw okay, put it this way. I saw someone do the following. He would diagnose another person with the the different conditions of the body simply by asking himself how strong is this person's um or how good is a person's sleep between zero and ten is it zero one two and at one point it hit a point six that's not moving five moves and seven moves he'd hit the six and he'd go okay this tells me that you're at a six out of ten of sleep a person said, well you know it's pretty much it we did this also with dates of birth places of birth people's height and so on. Uh, it's quite, quite, quite bizarre. Um, so the logic behind it is if we're telling a lie, then our body gets weak. And this is something we see, by the way, with the lie detection. Uh, we see it in the micro expressions, we see small flickers, but we also see how the body reacts and how the body seems weaker. I think the explanation is something like the brain takes more energy in order to build the lie and remember the lie than when they tell the truth. Um, and so it's some, something along, uh, along these lines. Lies make us weak, lies weigh us down, and truth sets us free. And all we have to do, it's a bit like the hot air balloon, all you have to do to go up is get rid of the weight, and then the hot air balloon takes care of itself. That's pretty much the way it is. So we, we have the choice. We either aspire to go upwards, and that requires accepting the truth, finding the courage to... to to, to embrace the truth, however unpleasant it might be, or we try to avoid the truth, and then we need lies. And then at one point, as the lies pile up, we go down, we hit rock bottom. And then we decide, we can stay there with all of the weight, or we can let go of the weight and see what happens. And when we do that, we float back to the surface, provided there's still oxygen in the lungs, you know, if we're underwater. There we go. Those are those are a few thoughts that I had. Um, let me just catch up with the with the, the chat. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Well. Okay. That that's a nice one. Um, he told me he was lying. A lying was was his default. But he was working on it. Okay. When, when liars tell us something, we can assume they're still lying. When, when they say, by the way, this is really important, if they say, I'm working on it, great, how? Specifically, be specific. This is the person saying, I want to get my health back on track. Great, how? What are you going to do? What are you going to do to get your health back on track? Change your diet, okay, how? Be specific. I'll eat more healthily, okay, how? Be specific. If the person is not specific, there's no intention. It's one thing for the person to say, yeah, I'm going to eat more healthily, Okay, it's something else for the person to say, for instance, so how about this, two different diets. I'm going to have, I'm going to eat um, low fat food and I'm going to, no, well, basically eat low fat food and count the calories. One diet, another diet, I'm going to cut out sugars and I'm going to cut out processed food. Both people will say I'm going to eat more healthily. The strategies are completely different and the outcomes will be pretty much opposite and it, you can look up the, the movie by the way um, that sugar film to see what low-fat diets do it's uh, it, 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 it's so cynical it's terrible so how will they do it you want to cut out lying how are you going to do it why is it a problem for you have them justify why it's a problem why they want to change what strategy they have if the strategy is not credible they don't mean to do it it's like the person yeah I'm gonna you want to quit smoking or quit drinking? How are you going to do it? I'll work it out. <laughs> really? Really? Like, you, you're going to wing it. You're, you're seriously, you're a liar, a pathological liar, and you're going to wing it. 
How is that going to work out? It's, that's so easy to predict. If someone doesn't have a strategy and a goal and how they're going to get there, just just forget about it. They're not serious about it. So that's that's a pretty that's a pretty good um, pretty good filter. Um, yeah, th this is one of the crazy things with the guilt and the shame. Once we realize we've been duped, it's so much easier to say, well, I based my actions on something. Sure, I got things wrong. But a number of things I did were, were, were genuine. But actually, I got duped. They're blaming me. This often is the case, so I assume that might be the case, you and I. They're blaming me for 100% of the results. Whereas, clearly, it's not 100% and you actually lied to me. I acted in good faith. I made mistakes, but I acted in good faith. But you misled me. Therefore, 100% of the responsibility is not mine. I'll take my share. This, incidentally, I think you've seen me do this before. Oopsie. I think you've seen me do this before. But this is just to talk about the guilt and responsibility. Let's say that we have the entire responsibility in a relationship. 100% and 0%. So let's say there is you and there is the narcissist. The narcissist's version will be saying that 100% of the oops, 100 of the responsibility is yours. 100% of everything is your fault and they did nothing wrong. The real situation is if you have 100% of responsibility, part of it is yours and another part is theirs. So it can be easy to get defensive and say, well, I, you, you accuse me of this, but look, you did this. I think what's really, really important is to say, I will take 100% of my responsibility. There we go, of mine. And I will let you take 100% of yours. That sort of, there we go. According to Adler, that's the thing about tasks. You have your backpack with your stuff. I have my backpack with my stuff. I will not carry your backpack for you, and I won't ask you to carry mine. 100% of the weight is not in my backpack. I have a backpack. I made mistakes, absolutely. I will carry 100% of my weight. That's responsibility. But I won't carry yours, and you're not going to make me carry yours. And when you use guilt-tripping and, and blaming and shame, that's to try to make me carry yours. The, these are keywords, by the way, look out for. People talking about shame and guilt are people trying to manipulate others. This is a framework of a manipulative, oh, a manipulator, basically playing parent role, trying to manipulate others. I have yet to see people use those words who are not either being manipulated or manipulating others. Why? Because responsible people don't use those words. We talk about responsibility um, and accepting part of our responsibility and letting other people take their responsibility and talking respectfully with different people. Um, let me go through this because because the, the, the chat's really good. Um, and then we'll wrap up rather soon, by the way. So wrap up in a few minutes. Yeah, the, the 200 characters, well, of course you can type it down for yes exactly <laughs> they only burned burn, burn down a part of the city yeah exactly no, it wasn't the whole city it's like you, you yeah anyway it's not it's, that, that framework is not helpful um, and the people defending it aren't, they're just confusing others it's not helpful it's not helping anyone it's, uh, it's terrible um, okay yeah, that's important. Everyone on their path. Um, incidentally, I remember someone was... Oh, Johnson family. Hi. Good to, good to see you. Welcome. Um, yeah, listen, when, when, when a parent is hurting the child, it's, it's terrible. One of the tough things to do, like super tough, is to trust that the child will be okay in the end. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy. Doesn't mean it's going to be. Doesn't mean it is okay. 
but the child will work it out, they will be okay. There's support, there's therapy, there, there are plenty of ways of getting somewhere uh, that ends up being all right. It doesn't mean we're okay watching it, especially as a parent. The last thing you want is for them to, to, to be hurt and to suffer. So having the two points of view, I think, is important. Of course, having the empathy and not wanting any of that, and also trusting that despite the suffering, they will be okay in the end, and they have choices, and it's, it's a tough, tough ride, which I wanted to jump into what you and I you were saying about staying on the path. An image I, I could, it, um, a guy was using, a therapist was using, is saying life is about going from the starting point to where we're supposed to end the goal. And our parents do their best. So they put us on exactly the right path to reach the goal. So we start out on a tangent. Because they think that that's the right way to do it. We realize we're on a tangent, so we go back to the other side. Okay, then we realize it's not really working out. And then we start zigzagging and crisscrossing. And our goal is to get as close as possible to the goal in the end. Will we reach it? Who knows? But our goal is to get as close as possible. Another, another point of view that I think is really helpful is one of these things that is not really possible to falsify, but it helps us lead a better life and get better outcomes. And that is to say that, and this, by the way, Jung was using this, Adler was, uh, was using it, so serious psychotherapists, is to say, life gives us the opportunity to learn that which we have chosen to learn, or that, we, that which we must learn, so chosen like on a soul level. And we'll get that opportunity again and again and again until we learn it or until we die. Then after we die, in the next life, we'll come back and get it again. So that's the image of you're stuck in the heart with a dragon, you're terrified of the dragon. If you want to die in that hut, you can die in the hut. In the next life, you'll be in the same hut. And in the next life, you'll be in the same hut until you open that bloody door and you go and face the dragon. And then the more we do that, the more we progress, the easier things are and the further we go. Not easy. Again, not saying this is true. However, it's a helpful framework. If instead of thinking, I'm afraid of the dragon, we start thinking, I'm afraid of spending my next 10 lives here stuck in this log cabin facing the dragon. It makes it easier to go, well, instead of having the small fear in front of me, I've got the massive fear behind me and that's going to push me forward. And we know what the right thing to do is. Just like with the, the, the story of um, Sir Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, fear indicates to us where we should go. That which we are afraid of is that is the place where we should go. That's where we're going to grow. Counterintuitive. And in my experience, true. We see this with toxic people. We can be afraid of conflict. When you step up and you look them in the eyes and you go, you really want to do this? That's when they chicken out and back away. They keep pushing because they don't believe you can do conflict. When you actually start asserting boundaries and do the thing of going, this is a boundary. You don't seem to understand. You will understand. You don't know how you will understand. You will understand and you're not going to like it. They might want to check to see if you're willing to do it. If you are, that's where their worldview breaks down because suddenly you're breaking the game uh, and you're becoming autonomous. And of course, they, they absolutely hate that. Um, so yeah, here. Well, the question of staying on the path. Sorry, I keep getting sidetracked. Uh, <laughs> I was about to say, I will blame you for posting good comments. But um, there we go. I think that we can use blame with a bit of humor because I appreciate the comments. So staying on staying on the path Let's imagine that this is the time we spend with a narcissist. We can continue if we want to. The real question is, this person, are they helping me get closer to my goal? Are, are they part of an interesting path or are they willing to change? If we realize that their path is leading us completely astray and probably, oops, and probably straight into hell, well, if we see we're going that way, what are we going to do? If we realize that the car is heading to a brick wall, what do we do? We want to stay on. If, if you want to stay in the car, that's fine. You can do it. But if you don't want to crash, then you might have to 
hit the brakes, change the direction. Um, so that's what I think about with the uh, with the, the the staying on the path. Christina, hi. Um, oh Jesus, you have hopium addiction to helping him. How do I deflect when he attempts to blame me for not having a good relationship with his daughter after he destroyed it? Okay, first of all, you have a lot of, first thing, hopium and addiction to helping him. Okay, I have a few videos on this. I recommend you watch them. However, in a nutshell, what would lead you to believe that he actually wants help? What, what has he done specifically to make you believe that he wants something to be better and it's not working out perfectly? If you have a credible reason to believe the person wants to improve something and they've demonstrated it and you'd rate it as being high credibility and they are receptive, then maybe, maybe you have a possibility of helping them and small probability of being successful. But if they haven't, you've got a near certainty that it's not going to work out it's just a game. Um, how do you... How do you deflect when he, here we go, when he attempts to, to, to blame you for not having a good relationship with his daughter after he destroyed it? What do you care? That no, was a serious question. What, why do you care what he blames you about? If, if, I, if I blame you for, you know, I, I'm trying to think of something. If I blame you, for, well, first of all, if he blames you, all right, let me see how to do this. I'm trying to keep the time, but let me go through this quickly. Okay. There is you, there is him, and there is the judge. Okay? He blames you. You want to justify. Who do we justify ourselves to? We justify ourselves to a judge. If he blames you, who is he playing? He is playing the judge. I blame you, you need to answer to me. But he is not the judge. He is just some random dude. And all he's doing is he is criticizing you. And he can blame you as much as he like. Well, are you? why would you argue? Are you trying to change his opinion? Do you believe that he can process the information you provide to him accurately, with fairness, that he's interested in and being fair and objective outcomes and best outcomes and being honest? And if so, what leads you to believe that? Or do you believe that he's try to, just trying to, to wind you up? If someone is unreasonable, they can blame you of anything. It doesn't matter. You know, and then destroying the relationship with his daughter or not having a relation, good relationship with his daughter. If I understand he's an ex, why should you, why would you want a good relationship with his daughter? If she's not interested in having a good relationship with you, that's fine. It's her responsibility. Even if she's four years old. Children are, they might be children. We can treat them with respect. If a four-year-old chooses to not have a good relationship with a neighbor, okay, just don't make it worse. What are you going to do? Imagine, imagine a four-year-old decides that they hate the neighbor. Do you go to the neighbor and shout at them? Why did, don't you have a good relationship with my daughter? I don't know. Daughter doesn't want it. You, it's, it's, it's not necessary. And it's not necessary to argue with people or convince people, especially when they, they make up bizarre, bizarre statements here with, uh, with this. Oh yeah, like, like you and I, like you're saying, um, no, you don't, you don't deflect. You simply don't argue because the person, this person is not a judge. You argue with judges. If someone says something unreasonable, you don't, you don't need to argue. What happens there? Got other videos on this. Um, what happens there is, if we take the adult child parent dynamic, this is from transactional analysis. Okay, parent adult child, four children, natural, adapted, rebel, and little professor. Then you've got two parents, you've got the critical and the nurturing. What is happening is this person is not talking to you adult to adult. They're talking down to you from critical parent. I could go into much more explanation about this, but they're playing the role of a critical parent. Um, 
So this transaction analysis talks about ego states. We all fluctuate between the different ego states at different points in time. The adult is us talking now. We're equals. I've got different expertise to you. I'm not a better person than you. I, I know things you don't. You know things I don't. So we share ideas. Am I right? Well, I put forth the ideas. You judge. Disagree. It's fine. It's cool. Um, if they're arguments, if you see, by the way, if you see some, if you see someone, quote unquote, disagreeing, but the disagreement is an insult, such as you're an idiot, you're stupid. That's ridiculous. That's not an argument. That's an insult. People lead with the strongest argument. When the strongest argument is an ad hominem attack, that's not an argument. That tells us the person either has cognitive dissonance, so believes that you're wrong but doesn't have any arguments. They hallucinate reasons, such as you're an idiot, which doesn't mean anything. Or they are literally idiots, and they are projecting. Or they are narcissists who just don't have logic, they can't think, and so they just attack other people doing ad hominems all the time. By the way, a hypothesis that I will explore is that narcissists are simply stuck continuously in a cognitive dissonance loop. I'd like to explore that at one point. Anyway, back to this. Adult, child, parent, children want to feel safe being loved, parents are anyone in a position of authority. If I talk to you and go, why did you do that? You shouldn't be doing this, you should know better, I'm acting out like a critical parent talking down to a child. If you're in a good, healthy, stable place, you're an adult and you go, that dude's weird. Like, what does he know? However, if you're vulnerable, you will hear me as critical parent talking down to you, possibly acting like an adapted child, possibly like a rebel, or like a little professor who has to justify what they're doing. I've seen, incidentally, this is bizarre, I've seen YouTube videos on narcissism where the, the person on the video is acting out the critical parent, being angry and wagging their finger, talking down to people, you're doing this wrong, or this. either you're doing this wrong, it was terrible, or doing, what happened to you, well, in this case it's a bit different, what happened to you was unfair and it was awful and I'm going to give you all this sympathy and all of these things. They're basically acting like the nurturing parent to soothe the child who is in pain. I mean, you can do that, but the thing is when we trap people in child mode, they're used to looking for a parent. So if we are in child mode, or if we're used to being in child mode and we haven't broken out of it and it's understandably in it, to be in it, and the person plays critical parent, it's so easy to then start justifying. How do I how do I answer? How do I manage this? When in reality, the healthy way of just, is to just look at them and go, you know, that's preposterous. You, you, you might you might as well, oh, there we go. You might as well blame me for eating your cockroach collection. You want to do that? Fine. Knock yourself out. Don't care. Uh, I suggest, incidentally, if you look up American philosopher Peter Bogosian, he did a really good video on street epistemology where some people started coming to attack him and insult him. And he was asked, doesn't it bother you? And he says, listen, that, that's where I got the image of the cockroach collection. If you're in a bar and someone runs in, runs into the, the, the toilet, starts eating urinal tablets and comes out and accuses you in front of everyone of eating the cockroach collection, do you care what they think or do you think the person is mentally ill? It's like, okay, obviously they're mentally ill. Because, well, that's how I see these people. They can't formulate arguments. They just attack other people. They're emotionally unwell. They're unstable. Uh, and they've got a lot of unresolved trauma. They're unwell. I have sympathy for them, but I don't care what they think about me. If I go into a lunatic... So this is me extrapolating. If you go into, quote-unquote, a lunatic asylum, and someone who is certif certifiably crazy starts rambling at you, you don't think, hmm, maybe they have a point. You think, dude, you're crazy. What you're saying is ridiculous. I'm not a giant bunny in disguise. You know, no, I didn't. I I didn't press the button that exploded the moon. I, I don't even know what you're talking about. It doesn't make any sense. In an extreme example like that, it's easier to dismiss it as, going, as being complete rubbish. When it's a personal attack, if we're a little bit insecure, it's much easier to think, well, maybe they have a point. Maybe I should have done better with this person's daughter. Like, yeah, maybe, but... It didn't happen, so so what? What are we going to do about it now? Blaming, incidentally, 
if we have past, present, future. There we go. Blaming is located in the past. And the goal of the blame is to create guilt in order to force um, to force an action in the future. And that's how it's manipulation. Um, yeah, you did something in the past. Okay, what do we do about it now? So no, no, no. I want you to feel guilty, so you will do what I tell you to do. No, <laughs> like you made a mistake. You know, here's the alternative of doing it. Mistake. I made a mistake. I take responsibility, and we we forgive, uh, forgive, and let's say adapt or do something. Such as, I broke your vase. I'm really sorry. I offer you an apology and I will buy you a new one. Okay, it's not the same thing as, I can't believe you broke my vase. Like, yeah, I didn't do it on purpose. Obviously not. Um, yeah. So that's just a few, a few, a few words. Uh, let me just see here. I hope that was helpful, by the way. Um... Okay. Yeah, so and that's an interesting point, you know, hand back to him the responsibility of him causing the alienation. But why 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 debate? I would I'd suggest it's the, the image of don't wrestle with a pig. Why? Because you end up covered in mud and the pig enjoys it. If they want whatever they want, stop giving it to them. They can accuse you of whatever you want. Why would you why would you care about what they think? If it's an ex and it's their daughter, that they're, they're out of your life. It doesn't matter, it's part of the past. If it's your common daughter, that's completely different, of course. Um Oh dear. Okay. Yeah, I'd suggest I'd suggest just don't engage, shrug it off. And you, you, the one who shrug it off is but in that case, you know, you haven't had a good relationship with her. Okay. I think usually okay is a good way to, a good way just to stop the conversation. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Um, what do you suggest? Or, you know, if it's their daughter, it's like, we're not together anymore. I'm not sure it's relevant. Um, or oh, it's a bit too, anyway, just uh, take a step back and we don't need to respond. We don't need to engage. There we go. I hope this was helpful. I know I got on quite a few tangents. I see we had a lot of people join. That's very cool. Thank you for everyone who joined. Thank you for the for your for your support. Uh, thank you for the questions. Thank you for um, yeah. Thank you for 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 encouraging me to to do this. Like uh, I mentioned, new video out today about the different personas. So you might enjoy that. Uh, if you if you have time and patience to look at the the longer videos, the video essays, that's something that the the YouTube algorithm really appreciates, and it gives you um, it gives you all of the context for the idea. So when I do the shorts, I just take out a small snippet. Hopefully, it's it's interesting, but it makes much more sense in the full context. Um, there we go. I'm going to end this. Thank you, thank you so much. Don't hesitate questions comments in uh, in the comments i do my best to keep up to date i know i missed a few of them so i apologize for that i do my best to uh, to, to to see and respond to more of them thank you um and remember things get better cut out the lies cut out the lies and see what happens it really is the equivalent to if you have a pond and there's a source of pollution stop the source of pollution see what happens if it stops getting worse it starts getting better most of these things take care of themselves. But main thing, stop the pollution and lies our pollution. Um, oh, happy got the notice. Excellent. No longer you. She's 17. He demands I fix of him because it's my fault. He's in this situation. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's hilarious. Okay. So where did I? I did a video about that, about the one of the, the tricks they play. The upside and downside. They want to make their problems your problems. So, yeah. 
He wants you to fix it. It's like, you're doing okay with the situation. One thing you could do to shut him up could be to go, do you really need somebody else's help to mend this? Is that too difficult for you? But of course, beware, if you do something like this, some provocation, you don't know how they're going to respond. And they can respond in a pretty mean way. So be mindful. Be mindful. Be careful. Um, oh yeah, one last tip. If you want to get a toxic person out of your life, I suggest looking for the strategy with the highest certainty and the lowest risk. And be as precise as a surgeon or as like ruthless as an assassin. If it takes one bullet, that's it. Not more. Get out. You don't have to argue. You don't have to justify. If you need to take all of the blame to get out safely, get out. Take all the blame. Um, sometimes you need to do that just to get out. You're right. I made mistakes. Everything. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I apologize. And out. And you go, okay, at least I'm away from that lunatic. Instead of, I'm going out because you lied to me. Like, no. Don't do that. The goal, if the goal is to get out, reach the goal with the highest level of certainty and the lowest expenditure of energy and mind, uh, and headspace, okay, and time. Thank you, everyone, for 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 joining. Thank you for sharing. I see Shiva's girl is so great, is very grateful uh, for everyone being here and supporting. Yeah, it's a tough time, and it gets better. It can get better really quickly. The faster you rip off the bandage, the, the, the better it gets. Don't know your situation, of course. Main thing, start with um, with truth. If you look up on my website, I've got three articles about overcoming a narcissist, and one of them is specifically about choosing truth. Um, I think I put a photo of, what's his name, Cypher in The Matrix, the guy who prefers the lie, like the fake stake to the reality. You can be that guy, but that's hell. The alternative is truth. It's not great, but... But actually it is. <laughs> actually, the alternative truth is amazing. Much better, much better. There's so, so many beautiful moments. It's not fake, it's real. And it's more beautiful than we can imagine. So today's child. Hi, happy to see you. Um, yeah, excellent. Let me know if any questions, anything. Thank you, everyone. I wish you a great 